wanted to talk to about today is this, this idea of data science and how do we make data really work for you, especially in things of turning into a product. We all know data is important. In fact, you've heard it all the time. It's in all the media reports. But how do we really know it's that important? I mean, the best way we know it is, is that it's on all these magazine covers. It's out there every day. It's in front. You can pick it on the newsstands. I mean, heck, it's even on the bestseller list. You go out further, it's in the New York Times and all the popular media. I mean, people are even creating lists of the top data scientists. And as you think about it, the demand for data scientists is at a record high. It's, and this is real data from LinkedIn, and it's growing, like, it's growing crazy. You could call it data is the new black. It's a new way of thinking about it. It's a new thing that everyone has to have. But what is that if we really think if we're going to ground this and think about this in reality and how it really impacts you? So one of the things I think is important is to step back and think about that for a, a second of reality. And what I wanted to do is I brought an experiment here to show this to you. So I thought we'd do a, a little bit of an experiment. And so this experiment, hopefully you guys, can you guys all see that? Hopefully you guys out there on the web can see this as well. This is a really simple device. It's a double pendulum. In fact, it's one of the first double pendulums ever used to actually prove something called chaos theory. Very, very simple device. Everything about this device can be described with four variables. So the position of this blue piece, the position of this piece, the angular velocity of this piece, the angular velocity of this piece. That's all. That's all you need to do. So to give a sense of, of how complex this thing is, we're going to play a little game. So first, I need everyone to raise your right hand. Now you can see the people. OK, so far, so good. Good that Europe knows their rights. <laughs> All right, now I need you to say, raise your left hand. Simon didn't say, put down your right. OK, now on the count of three, we're going to practice here. So this is, what you, this is the most critical part of this. So you take both hands, and we do this. One, two, three. This time, we're going to try to do it with some enthusiasm. One, two, three. OK. Now, for those of you that are out there on the web, you've got to play along. And now, here's your trick. Here's what we're going to do. Your job is to guess when the last time this blue piece goes through here. So you want to guess the last time. And you're going to signal when the last time it happens by clapping. So if it goes through and, it cla and you clap and it goes through again, what happens? You lose. Don't be a loser. Okay. If it goes through and somebody else claps before you, what happens? <laughs> you still lose. Let's not be losers out here today. OK, so you get it? Everyone's got the idea? We can see the people that are type A people. They're sitting there ready. We can see the people that are too cool. They're sitting there. Yeah, I got this. I did physics. I did maths. All right, so here's what you do. Because this is a little difficult. You're going to actually get two claps, two claps to do this game. Double check this here. All right, so here we go. Last time that blue piece is going to go through. Good job so far. <laughs> so think about this for a second. When was the last time? This, everything about this, every single thing about this system can be described with four variables. When was the last time you looked at a spreadsheet with four variables? It's got pivot tables and all this data, and yet, What's going on? Why do you have that, if you look around and you sort of think of that, that surprise of like, oh my gosh, why is this doing something so strange? Like, why is it doing that? Faster, spin faster, right? Why is it, why is it doing that? That moment is every one of you is a data product. Yeah, let's see, that might be it. That's pretty good. So in fact, good job. So in fact, with this, if you, if you put two of these together and you let them go at the same time, you would get exactly the same behavior for about a couple seconds, and then it'd be doing very, something very different. But getting back to that moment of surprise, that moment of surprise that you see, every one of you is a data product. Why are you a data product? Your eyes are taking in observations. You're seeing this. You're seeing the movement. You're seeing the trajectory. Your brain is processing it. You're making a prediction. You're making an analytical forecast. And you know what? You suck at it. Right? We, it's like that moment of surprise. The forecast is breaking down. Nice try. Ooh, really not a nice try. 
right? That moment of surprise, that aspect is telling us we're a bad, bad data product. So what do we take away from this? What are the important lessons? The first, whoop, the important lessons are that there's two important things that you can do from this when you think about managing and chaos. And the aspect of this about chaos is you can actually create a control system that is going to allow this to be balanced. You can balance this forever on out. It's actually a real simple control algorithm. And the thing to do is, because the system is chaotic, you need two really fundamental important things. First, you have to have lots and lots of observations, very high speed observations. And then if you want to balance this and keep it upright, you need to have very fast control mechanism. So think about that in your business. What does that mean? What does that mean for your systems that you, you work with every day? You got to have a lot of data coming in, you have to process it, and then you have to act on it quickly. So how do I get that across to you in another simple way? It's with this, broomstick. So you ever try to play that game, balancing a broomstick? Yeah? No, you guys don't do that in this? <laughs> right, you balance it, right? Now, you ever try to do it drunk? Homework, right? So what happens is it's hard to do. Your latency, you have latency in the system. And what happens is you can't control it. The same way as if you try to do it in a dark room where you don't have the observations. That's what starts to break that down. And so as we think about this, and we know that we have these complex, nearly chaotic systems, how do we take that and actually take that data and turn it back into a product thesis of how, how we actually make products really work? And the one way I want to do about this is to tell you a small story about the power of data science and what really can happen when you apply data science. And that story starts with the, the whole idea of people you may know. If you're on LinkedIn, you'll see it in the upper right module, and it gives you a list of people that you might know. And the story of people you know goes back several years, when, with starting with this guy, Jonathan Goldman. Jonathan is, uh, is a physicist, didn't work a whole lot with systems or uh, high tech, what you could call computers. And uh, he joined as the second data scientist at LinkedIn. And when, as he was thinking about this problem, about LinkedIn and as his time of trying to struggling about how to grow LinkedIn and how do we add more users, one thing became very clear, very obvious, that there was this fundamental problem that you all faced. When you got here to the web for the very first time and you were kind of sitting in that reception area, what happened? What, what was the real thing that happened? Were you the kind of person that walked around the circle of the audience on the outside? You're kind of a person that like, tries to go find coffee or a drink at the reception and just kind of sits there and you're like, hey, yeah, what's up? Yeah, I've seen you before, right? And how does that, how does it start to change once you realize that there's somebody you know? You know, you kind of do that classic thing, oh, yeah, and you just keep talking and you keep making idle chit-chat. And then finally you realize, oh, there's somebody else I know. Thank God Loic's here. And then you ditch up, see, I got to go. And then you go hang out with them, right? Because you know somebody different. And how does it change? Once you realize that all your people are here, like these are my people, they're all here, right? You fundamentally feel different. So this same exact problem exists online with two big caveats. When you get to LinkedIn or any social network for the very first time, it's as if you're showing up to that room at a conference where you're not sure if your people are here, that fundamental uncomfortable feeling. But there's two big important differences. The first problem is, that you can't see across the room. It's like the lights are out. The second problem is that you can instantly teleport away at any given moment. Why? Because you just close the browser window. You just move away. So as you're thinking about that, what Jonathan realizes, hey, there's this problem, this fundamental thing. But shouldn't we be able to create an experience that actually shows you these things, that actually tells you who's here and simulates that? And the answer is yes. And how do you do that is you just create a little module. And you say, oh, well, I could create a, a, a set of algorithms. And here's the secret. So I'm going to tell you the secret of people who know. And the answer is you already know it. How do you construct a people who know algorithm? Well, what's the very first question you ask somebody when you meet them for the first time? What do you do? Where do you work? Where do you live? Where'd you go to school? Oh, you know Leek? I know Louis. Well, we probably should know each other. Triangle closing. That's it. That's all you have to do. So you take that sort of very simplistic approach, and you can come up with those lightweight heuristics. And here's the thing. 
once you had that, Jonathan went to the product people in the different parts of the organization and said, hey, I'd like to actually go build this. And everyone said, well, that's not really a priority. We got these scaling issues. We got address book importers. We have search. You know, not really an important thing. So Jonathan said, hell with that. In fact, we got to do something better. So what he did is he took these three, three results for every person. He created those three heuristic rules for every single person, and he created an ad. He created an ad slot on LinkedIn, and he put those results in an ad slot. And so what happened because of that is he's able now to just deploy that to every single user in those three results. So if that result is good and you click on it, you'd go to the place to actually add that connection. But then you might see that ad again. It'll have the same thing. But here's a really insight, insightful part of this. The most important part of this was it had astonishing click-through rate. And so very quickly what happened is one single guy was able to show this massive meme change. And it was so powerful, quickly you saw this feature on Facebook and you saw it on every other social network. And here's the thing about that. One single data scientist with an idea, with access to a bunch of the data in the system, was able to become a massive, massive lever arm to change not only the course of LinkedIn, but the entire way social networks worked and operated. So that's great, great. We hear about power of data scientists, that's one guy. How do you make data work for you? How do you make this a scalable process? We said demand is at an all time high. You've heard like, oh, we need these data scientists, all these kind of people. How are you supposed to do that? And that's what, when Josh and I started stepping back and thinking about this, we realized that there is a much more important way to think about this, a framework that you can actually take and apply every, to every product, to every analysis. And what we call that is a data scientific method. And to explain that, I really have to introduce you to who I think is the best data scientist in the world, in fact, probably the galaxy, and it's this guy, Spock. Why is Spock so damn good? He's on the bridge. When Kirk sees the Romulans and the Klingons, what does he do? Does he send an ensign down the turbo shaft into the bowels of the ship and say, hey, I need some data on these guys? And then the, ensign, the data guys say, you know, that's not really the data you want. They say, just give me the damn data. And then he goes back, takes the data up to the bridge, and the captain says, what the hell is this? This is what I asked for. And you go back and do it. No, what happens is on the bridge, there's Spock, Kirk gets to turn him and say, what do you think, Spock? And that's the key thing. They're not just talking about a process. They're using data to have a conversation. And the whole thing about this is how do we take data and not just use it to make decisions, but to have a conversation and then lead it in the product. And that's a central tenet. And now as we start to think about this, what we want to do for the next remaining portion of this time is really walk you, and Josh is going to walk you, out, walk you through a very specific example of how this was applied uh, at Twitter. Thanks, DJ. So what we've been talking about uh, between DJ and I is we've both been part of some really amazing kind of data-driven product organizations, and we've, you know, every, a lot of people who come to us with various companies and ask us, you know, for help, are really asking us how do we become more data-driven. And so as we were talking through all of the ways in which you know, we kind of helped products really um, grow and sort of help bring this into the organization, we realized there was a really common set of patterns that we both used in bringing this kind of data-driven development into these companies. And so we looked back to science and realized that all the methods that we've been using are actually very, very similar to what a normal chemistry person does when they're doing their own experiment, starting with a question, um, coming up with a hypothesis, doing a bunch of analysis, and then really looking back at the data from all of their experiments to figure out what kind of conclusions they can draw and what kind of further experiments or what kind of other meaning they can have um, in science. And so we decided to take that same scientific method and really apply it to data science and really to make that into product development orga uh, organization. And so if you just take a second and kind of read the five steps of what we're going to talk through, this is what we're starting to call the data scientific method. 
And so I want to, before I go into the data science, I want to walk you through where Twitter was when I joined kind of in the uh, latter half of 2009. And 2009 was an incredible year for Twitter. It, would, it was on Oprah. The whole world was finding out about Twitter. If you really went around and asked a lot of people, have you heard of Twitter? Everybody would say yes. And then if you asked them the follow-up question, do you use it? They pretty much all say no. And we would ask, why don't they use it? And they would say, I don't want to know what people had for breakfast. I don't really want to tell everybody I had for breakfast. It was this really interesting problem where everybody thought Twitter was this thing they should be using. And we were getting tens to hundreds of thousands of signups every day for Twitter. But we were in this weird spot where only you know, three out of four people weren't even sticking around to use the product in their second month. And so we spent a lot of time really trying to figure that figure out how could we get people using Twitter and really growing in the way that some core group of people actually had. And so before I go through kind of all the learning and the sort of data scientific method we applied to Twitter, I just want to show you a little bit about what the Twitter sign-up process looked like at that point in 2009, because it didn't really set people up well to engage with the product. So you'd come to the homepage here, and it would ask you, what is Twitter? Which, if you're coming to sign up, you're hoping that Twitter is actually going to tell you. And then it would let you create your account, and then the first thing it would do is say, hey, there's a bunch of other people here. In fact, there were 20 random people selected out of this thing called the suggested user list that would show you, you could start following them, and they would sort of be pre-selected. So you still don't really know what Twitter's about. You click Finish, and all of a sudden, you get right to a timeline. You have a big box that tells you to try to type in something about what's going on, and again, you don't even know what to say, and you see people who you don't actually recognize in your feed. What was amazing to me when I joined Twitter was a lot of people still got through this hurdle and were really deeply engaged in the product and were loving it. But most people who we looked at, you know, that over 75% kind of gave up and never came back. So we, going back to the data scientific method, we started with a key question. Why do the people who love Twitter get it? And how can we help all the other people who aren't getting it get there much faster? So the next step of the data scientific method is to go leverage your existing data, to go through and say, how can you actually understand behavior from what's currently happening in your product and site? And so at Twitter, we started to ask a couple of key questions. What is it about the people that get it? Can we separate the people who understand and are actively using Twitter from those that aren't? And so we looked at, at this interesting chart, basically, that said, how many times did you use Twitter in one month? Did you come back in the second month? And just in doing that simple analysis, we got a really interesting data point. You can see on the curve here that right around seven times a month was this magic number. That if you use Twitter at least seven times in a month, that was a good signal to us that you'd pretty much gotten it and been able to be a really deep um, habitual user of Twitter. Over 90% likely you'd come back month over month. Most people who signed up might have used it the first day, might have come back once, but didn't really stick at all. So from this magic number of seven, we then tried to go one level deeper. And we asked ourselves, of those people who get it, what's different about them? Why do they seem to understand how to use Twitter and get a lot of value out of it, and most people who sign up don't? And we found two amazing data points from working through all the data with the, the data science team. And the first one was once you followed at least 30 people, the likelihood that you were going to be a long-term user was like almost guaranteed. You'd somehow manually curated lists of stuff that was interesting to you. And then the second really interesting phenomenon was when the people who really got Twitter had this interesting ratio where of the people that they followed, two-thirds of them they just followed to absorb their information, and one-third of them they followed and followed them back. So we started calling this the 2010 rule. You follow 20 people, you have 10 people who you follow that follow you back, just to keep things simple. And we realized this was a really fundamental paradigm of the product that the data was actually showing us. And so if we could go back and rebuild the product to help everybody get to this, these couple of magic numbers faster, following 30 people, having this one-third, two-third ratio, we thought maybe we'll get a lot more people to stick around with Twitter. So this, so th this was this great leveraging our data to get to the next step of the data scientific method, to create features and run tests. You have to think of creating features just like the, old, the scientists were doing experiments. We have these hypotheses now. If we can get people to 30, if we can get them to follow two-thirds uh, two of the people one way and another one-third two-way, maybe they'll get Twitter. Now let's actually go and run some experiments. So what I'm going to walk you through now is what the Twitter sign-up flow looks like today. And this is the result of two and a half years of experimentation and interpretation. And I'll just give you some of the stories of how we got there using all this data science. So the first is, this is now the first page right after you sign up for Twitter. And if you look at this page, it really, there's nothing to do. 
It says, this is a tweet, a tweet's 140 characters, click next. And so when you're thinking about products, our general intuition is to not add friction, to have fewer steps, to make things really simple. But we found at Twitter, the very first experiment we did took the new user flow from two steps to three. And when we did that, we had a 30% increase in completion rate because the steps were much clearer and you were much more contextually set up, and a 20% increase in people actually sticking around. Now, we did a lot of changes in those steps that you'll see in the next few pages, but we kind of broke that intuition immediately that adding steps is not a bad thing if they help people understand the meaning of the product. The second thing we learned is we could use little motivation tricks to get people much, much closer to that magic number of 30. Now, I think following 30 people when you first sign up for Twitter is still pretty daunting. So we weren't trying to say, you must follow 30 or bust, but we'd use little encouragement. If you see here, the button says, follow two more. And actually, if you haven't followed anybody, the button is gray before it, it starts. Um, uh, the, the progress bar is gray before you followed anything. And the next button is actually disabled until you've at least followed one person on the page. So just by forcing you to the habit of following people, you start to understand Twitter better. And this, this whole change caused these great uh, increases in our acceptance rate. The next trick we learned was that it, we could still do a lot of product design and innovation and intuition around it. A lot of people say, well, once you start using data science, all you're going to be looking at is exactly which shade of blue a link needs to be. And that's not what this kind of method is all about. We have this big product theory that because you needed a two-thirds of interesting things to follow, we want to introduce categories to help you find the news or sports or celebrities you might be interested in. And we believe that was the best way to get you to those two-thirds. And so we built an entire experience around that, which you see here. This shows the NFL category. We had NFL, uh, NBA, music, uh, entertainment, politics, government, etc. And we really believed that that was a great way to introduce people to Twitter so that when they, even if they didn't follow through and, and get fully engaged, they would understand that Twitter has all this amazing content that's accessible to them with just a follow. And then the last part of the process now is still the find friends step. And as DJ talked about with the people you may know features at LinkedIn, finding the people who you are familiar with and you'll have those two-way connections is still really important. But at Twitter, we made this big conscious thing that was very different than a lot of social thinking at the time. We put this last. We said, please go follow all these interesting sources, get that two-thirds following set, start to build up first, and then go finish it with the one-third um, group, which are the people that you really may know. And this was a really important and kind of controversial statement at the time. Most sites you sign up for are like, here's a bunch of friends who are on the service. But most services, your friends are there isn't actually the core value that you're trying to get out of it. And so we really think that we found that introducing it later really helped drive up the further engagement with Twitter and what Twitter was all about. So as I've kind of talked about here, we went through these many steps of experimentation and we kept analyzing the results and drawing insights and we didn't just turn these back and say, OK, this blue is better, or this button color is better. But we really had these deep conversations about the data and the kind of product that we could design around it. And those conversations were what was most important. I think the other part that's really interesting is that these conversations weren't just about this new user flow and sign up, which most people think, OK, well, that should be data driven, but I'm going to design my core product just you know, in the way that I think about it. But it really transformed the core product to Twitter, too. Over time, as we kept realizing that people want to come to Twitter to consume information and discover information and participate in that information, Twitter really changed from, remember the, the screenshot I showed you at the beginning where there was a big box to enter text at the very top of the screen? That box is much smaller now and is much less a critical piece of Twitter because the data has really shown us over time that this is how people want to use it and we've evolved the product, um, something like this. So, you know, since I've left Twitter last summer, I've seen just amazing growth along all of these lessons. And what's really important as you're building up a company is to bring in this kind of data scientific method to development and think about data and have that part of the conversation from the earliest stages. So I think as you really think about data science, I think what DJ and I were really trying to share today is how important it is to get the right data, track it in a seamless manner, and then really use it to bring it in to ask great questions and have seem, uh, really important, meaningful conversations with the entire product development team. It's not product managers and designers and data scientists in a corner, but everybody coming together to really evolve the way the product needs to go and listen to what the users are saying and doing. Yeah, Thanks. I think, oh, and so just to add to what Josh is saying, if you think about these five steps, in one sense, they seem really trivial, they seem really easy. 
The key part is they're designed to be easy because they're a natural part of the product development process. What we often leave out is this question of data and how do we keep, keep this thing together. And if there's a couple things that are really critical to think about this in is you're starting with your gut. You're starting with your intuition, but then you're letting data, as Josh was saying, frame the conversation. And you're using that to iterate to get better and better solutions. And so we're going to be around for the rest of the day. Talk, we'll be around if you want to talk more about it. And we're going to also be writing this up and sharing a little more about case studies shortly. Thank you. Thanks.